Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining RIT's Chai AI Seminar Series. I'm Chris Kanana, professor in the Center for Imaging Science. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Tom Goldstein. Goldstein. Um, he is a Pareto Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Maryland. His research lies at the intersection of machine learning and optimization and targets applications in computer vision and signal processing. And before joining Maryland, he completed his PhD in mathematics at UCLA and was the research scientist at Rice University and Stanford University. He has been a recipient of several awards, including uh, a DARPA Young Faculty Award, a JP Morgan Faculty Award, and the Sloan Fellowship. He's done a lot of innovative work um, and for myself, I've frequently referred to his paper on visualizing the lost landscape of neural networks in my deep learning class. Uh, it's just very, it's got beautiful illustrations. Every time people say, how did you do it? I'm like, oh, it's, it's clever. It's not, it, it's very nice. Um, um, but it's very pretty, pretty. And I think it is uh, characteristic of a lot of his work, which is interpretable, like in terms of like, you can convey it relatively easily and they're meaningful uh, meaningful contributions to the literature in terms of understanding uh, deep neural networks and how they work. Um, so anyways, today's talk is super exciting. I, I saw your abstract. I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to hear it. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Goldstein. All right. Thank you very much for such a nice introduction. Uh, I try to make uh, to show results that are interpretable, but today I might show a few things that might be very uninterpretable. We'll see what happens. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about work I'm doing in two different areas. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some of the stuff I'm doing with adversarial examples, and then I'm going to tell you about some of the uh, newer work that I'm doing on thinking systems. All right, so quick, uh, quick overview. I'll start by talking about what are adversarial attacks and what kind of cool things can we do with them. And uh, then I'm going to do just a total 180, and I'll switch to talking about these thinking systems, which is a bit of a different uh, topic. All right, so what is an adversarial example? I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this because I'm sure most of you have seen this before. Uh, you can make small perturbations to the inputs of a neural network that will change its outputs a lot. So I can take this 28% confident Egyptian cat, according to Resident 50, and I can make it into a 90%, 97% confident traffic light. And you look at the, back, the background of the traffic light photo, you'll notice there's some fuzz there that wasn't there before. And the idea is that if you just tweak the intensity of a pixel, either up or down, it has a very tiny effect on the output of a neural network. But if you have a million pixels and you can tweak, you can do that tweak a million different times and you can blow up those effects and make really strong um, manipulations to the output uh, of a neural network. <clears throat> um, and also read questions, just posted something in the chat about questions. I'm trying to keep the chat open and keep track, but if I don't see something, feel free to get on and, uh, and uh, mention it out loud and I'll stop and answer you. But I'll, if you put something in the chat, I'll try my best to get to it right away. All right, but one of the, you know, you've seen a lot of these sort of academic examples where you do adversarial attacks by adding a little bit of fuzz to images and manipulating classifiers. One thing we're interested in, in my lab is, you know, how far can these things go? Can we take these things from being toy, uh, you know, toy demonstrations and, and, and show that they really work on real world industrial systems? And one of the first things we looked at was copyright detection systems. Uh, things like YouTube Content ID, Google Jigsaw, which is a system for detecting illegal content. Uh, audio tags, an online system for detecting copyrighted material. And, um, uh, you know, is it possible to use adversarial attacks to bypass these kinds of machine learning based systems? One of the ones we focused on was the Shazam app. Uh, the Shazam app, there's actually an old, it's actually a pre deep learning app, but there's an old paper uh, on how the original Shazam algorithm worked. I'm sure they've moved on to deep learning based methods. But uh, we actually built a differentiable Shazam based on the original algorithm in TensorFlow. And uh, what it does is it looks at segments of audio and extracts what's called a fingerprint from them, which is basically just a hash. And then it can search for a, a, do a nearest neighbor search for similar hashes inside of a database. And so we built a differential implementation of this hash generator. And by backpropping through it, we can do optimization on uh, segments of, of audio and we can make perturbations to them that, that basically erase the fingerprints. We change these fingerprints so that they can no longer be recognized by the Shazam algorithm. And if we do a white box attack, meaning that we have access to the algorithm, so if I do this on the actual Shazam implementation that we have, then we can make tiny perturbations that are so small that a human cannot even hear them that still wipe away all, all of these fingerprints. We then scale those perturbations up. So let's say we want to do a black box attack on something like YouTube system. I have no idea how that works. I don't really have a good model for it, 
And we're not going to try to reverse engineer it. But what we can do is just experiment. If you take a pretty crude attack like this and scale it up, will it break YouTube's algorithm? Uh, and it turns out it does break YouTube's algorithm with a perturbation that's audible, but still about five times smaller than it would take if you just did a random perturbation. So this is uploading a uh, Stevie Wonder song to YouTube, and you get this copyright claim. And if we upload the adversarial example version of it, uh, there's no copyright claim made. And we can do the same thing with audio tag with actually even smaller perturbations, a bit weaker of a system. So that's an example of a digital world attack. In the digital world, I can manipulate a digital object bit for bit, and I can hand it off to a machine learning system like Content ID bit for bit, and it will see bit for bit all of the perturbations that I made. And that makes it very easy to make very powerful perturbations uh, to a network input. But um, a more difficult thing, and I think the, 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 the adversarial examples community, at least early on, focused a bunch on this sort of attack, is a physical world attack where you want to manipulate a physical object in such a way that when it gets sensed by a machine using a camera, that the perturbations you made become adversarial. <clears throat> so here's an example of this. This is what we call our invisibility cloak. So if you just, this is an example of me standing uh, in a classroom at University of Maryland, and we ran the YOLO detector on this image, and the YOLO detector puts these blue bounding boxes around the people sitting behind me. But you'll see that there's no blue bounding box around me, even though I'm standing right in the middle of the image, and that's because I'm wearing this weird adversarial sweater. So a lot of people look at this and they say, well, you know, you're wearing a really weird sweater. Maybe any strange sweater would defeat the system. Uh, maybe it doesn't take any fancy adversarial methods. It actually turns out it does take some adversar fancy adversarial methods to defeat an object detector, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second. But first, how do we actually craft this attack? What we did is we took the Coco data set, which is an object detector data set. We load up images that have people in them. We run an object detector on it. And you'll see it detects all of these people, blue bounding boxes. And then the, the feature, the detector is actually outputting a feature map that looks like this. It's got these red dots, the places where it thinks there's a person. And it's got kind of blue and white dots and other places where the confidence is lower. So what we do is we run the detector on these objects. And anywhere we see a person, we, uh, we, we render this patch over them. And we render it with a little bit of random color jitter and a random nonlinear deformation to model that crumple of fabric and a uh, random perspective transformation and a bunch of other random things to sort of simulate what happens when you look at something in real life. And then we backprop through the system. We compute the L2 norm of this output feature map. And we backprop through and we make a gradient update to this patch so that the two norm of the resulting feature map is as small as possible. And by looping over the entire Coco data set, we're able to eventually train a patch that does this effectively. Um, so I mentioned it's really hard to defeat detectors. Here's some examples of that. You might think that this uh, camouflage outfit would defeat a detector, but actually other detectors are really good at finding camouflaged people and camouflaged animals. In fact, uh, for finding camouflaged animals, they're way, way better than humans are. This won't defeat a detector. You might think that just some wearing all these weird different colors and patterns with edges, you know, maybe that would fool the detector. This is an example of somebody wearing a, a um, entire a full body onesie with the similar kinds of colors and patterns um, and standing on a background that is has similar colors and patterns. And yet we did a whole photo session with this uh, onesie and this does not defeat the YOLO detector. Interestingly, this adversarial patch that I'm holding in front of myself does defeat the YOLO detector. But if I flip the patch upside down, now it detects me again. So it's not just a matter of having the right kinds of colors and, and shapes at the right size scales. You really need to have a very carefully crafted adversarial pattern to defeat uh, a system. There are very specific weaknesses inside the yellow detector that we are uh, exploiting. And this is an example. This is kind of a hasty video demo that we made right before the building was shut down for COVID a year ago. Um, but you'll see that when I put this uh, shirt in front of myself, I am no longer detected uh, by the YOLO detector. And actually, there's someone sitting behind me here. And uh, very often, you'll see that this bounding box, the person behind me, disappears. That's because the shirt is actually, remember, we didn't train it to remove specific people from the, from the image. We actually just train it to minimize the L2 arm of the entire feature map. So when you put the shirt on, it's sort of like you took a sawed off shotgun and you just blasted a hole in the middle of the feature map that's output by this uh, detector. Um, and if I cover myself up, you'll see that, I, that I'll come back into the frame. Um, so that's an example of an adversarial attack in the physical world. Um, another threat model, people are pretty familiar now, I think, with adversarial attacks. But another threat model that you might not be so familiar with is poisoning. 
And data set poisoning is a little different than a conventional adversarial attack. A conventional adversarial attack, you have a system that already exists, it's already trained, and I want to make a weird input that manipulates it. In poisoning, you haven't trained your system yet, but I want to manipulate the training data somehow. I want to make a change to the training data in such a way that I can then uh, embed behaviors, I can control the behavior of the system at test time. And there's different ways to do this. This is sort of a demonstration of it in a more academic context. Uh, so what we did is we poisoned ImageNet. Uh, in this case, I took ImageNet images and I poisoned one tenth of 1% of them. So here's some clean images at the top and you'll see that there's poison images down below with a little fuzz in them. And if I upload this data set to Google's AutoML API, I can actually pick the label that I want at test time for this random image that is not manipulated at train time. So, and it's not even in the training data, so it's a test image. So I can change the behavior, uh, change the labels that this uh, classifier assigns at test time just by poisoning a small fraction of the data set. And one of the reasons we use Google AutoML is we wanted to show that this could work without knowing what the training process was. I don't know what architectures Google AutoML uses. I don't know what optimizer they use. I don't know what batch size they use. I don't know what regularizers they use. I don't know what learning rate schedule they use. And yet we can still craft poisons that will, that will uh, modify the behaviors of their system. But image classifiers are a little bit toyish. Uh, why don't we see what we can do with you know, more sophisticated kinds of industrial systems? And one thing we're particularly interested in is data set privacy. Um, so what I would like to do, you know, we study all these attacks where we're sort of acting like the bad guy. We say, OK, what can the bad guys do? Maybe the bad guys can poison your data set. What I'm interested in is in situations where the good guys might want to poison the bad guys. So maybe you have a data set that you don't want someone to scrape. You want to keep it private. And so you might poison it to prevent bad uh, actors from scraping and using your data in a way that you don't want. So here's an example of this. Um, there's all these social media websites that leak a ton of your personal info about your identity. Uh, I think one of the, you know, Facebook gets a lot of flack for this, but one of the, you know, almost no one ever talks about LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is actually the worst offender. LinkedIn, you, you can basically just see everyone's professional quality photos and information about where they live. Uh, which is very useful for identifying people. Um, and then companies like uh, Clearview AI, which is one particularly uh, nefarious company that's been in the news um, recently, uh, they scrape all of these face images and your location, and then they sell uh, face identification services to various sometimes unsavory organizations. I mean, they sell this information to private companies. Uh, they also sell it to political organizations. And there was a big data leak from Clearview um, about a year ago where they turned out that they actually had some contracts with some uh, pretty extremist uh, political organizations on the far right. Um, they sell it to law enforcement agencies, which is a little bit questionable because it's not clear how um, you know, accurate or reliable their services are because they're proprietary. They can't really be audited publicly. Um, and then finally, they sell to the foreign governments. And interestingly, the CEO of Clearview has denied on numerous occasions that they have contracts with foreign governments. But then during this data leak from Clearview, it actually turned out that that was not true. They actually did have contracts with foreign governments that they hadn't disclosed. Um, so one of the questions I'd like to ask is if you have publicly available data sets that are scrapable, is there some way that we can just make them useless? Is there something we can do that just poisons the data so that you can't scrape this information and use it to train your own deep learning systems? And here's a way that you can do that with adversarial examples. So suppose that I have a, uh, you know, I train ResNet 50 and I have some decision boundary, okay? So when you train uh, a neural network, there's gonna be some region of input space, uh, it's called cat land, that's where all the cats live. And then we have Frogville, that's where all the frogs live. And uh, what I can do is I can take these, this cat and this frog image, and I'm going to add a little adversarial perturbation to them to move them across the decision boundary. So now I got a cat that lives in Frogville, and I got a frog that lives in Catland. All right. So let's say that I throw away all of the non adversarial images, and all I have to work with is adversarial examples. That's it. I got to train on these adversarial examples. The question is, how do you want to label them to get the best performance? Uh, and you might think, well, this looks like a cat. Let's label it as a cat. This looks like a frog. Let's label it as a frog. But actually, that's not what ResNet 50 wants. ResNet 50 wants things to be labeled like this. And in fact, you get the best model performance if you train with the cat labeled as a frog and the frog labeled as a cat. Reason being that you get when you train on these data, you get what are called what's called distillation behavior, 
which means that if you take x, y points from the function that ResNet 50 implements, ResNet 50 is some function from inputs to outputs. If you take x, y pairs from that function, and then you train a new neural network from scratch to replicate, so interpolate all of those x, y pairs, you basically get back the same function again. So if I train on this image labeled as a frog, well, that's uh, a sample from the function implemented by ResNet 50. Even though you think it's labeled wrong, that doesn't matter. It's a sample from the function implemented by ResNet 50, and so is this. And if you train on these samples, you'll get back the same ResNet 50 decision function. And interestingly, if you train only on these adversarial examples, so only on things that a human would say are labeled wrong, you actually get a classifier that looks that works really well on da clean data that is not preserved. So in this case, all of the cat images that this thing ever saw were labeled as frogs. And yet at test time, when clean cats come along, so this is the confusion matrix on clean data for something that was trained only on adversarial examples, even though a clean image of a cat comes along and looks at it and says, that's a cat, and it's right. Even though the only things that I ever saw labeled as cats, a human would have, would have said were frogs. Even though all the cats in the training set look like this, even though they all look like frogs, when a clean cat comes along at test time, it still knows that it's a cat because it adopted the same decision boundaries as ResNet 50. Here's an example of that. This is an actual image on the training data set. This is labeled as cat. This is a CIFAR image, so it's kind of fuzzy. I'll show you an image net image later that looks a lot better. And here's the original image. I can't tell there's any difference. But if you're going to train on this data, this base image better be labeled as a frog. That's what ResNet 50 wants. And if you're going to train on this image, it better be labeled as a cat. That's what ResNet 50 wants. OK, so there's this weird behavior. We can create situations where something that is labeled correctly to a human is labeled incorrectly to a machine. So what's the point? Suppose that I want to make an untrainable image. Now. I want to make a version of the ImageNet data set that's just garbage. You can't train on it. Well, the easiest way to do that is I'll just take all the ImageNet images and I'll just put the wrong label on everything. If all your data is labeled wrong, you can't train on that. You need correct labels, right? Um, but yeah, I don't have control over the label function. And when I put images up on LinkedIn, I'm not, you know, putting, you know, pictures of uh, random people up and then saying they're me. They put a picture of me up and they say it's me, right? So it's very often you can't really control the labeling function uh, for these sorts of things. And maybe they'll even have it labeled by uh, mechanical turkers, for example. So I don't have control over the labeling function, but I do have control over the data. And I need the data to be labeled correctly according to a human for the data to be useful on my website. So here's what I could do. We already saw that you can create data that is labeled correctly to a human, but wrong to a computer. Why don't we create data that's labeled correctly to a human? So to a human, everything seems fine. But to a computer, everything is just bonkers. And here's how we'll do that. This is the example we saw before. This data is labeled correctly according to a machine, but a human thinks it's labeled wrong. Let's just flip those labels. Now it's labeled wrong according to a machine, but correctly according to a human. The human looks at this and says, looks like a cat to me. What's the label? It's labeled as a cat. Great, that's labeled correctly. But to a computer, everything is all wrong because this is perturbed. When a computer sees this image, it, it sees a frog and it's labeled as a cat. And that's very confusing. It can't learn from this information. So here's an example of such an image. This is from the image in data set. In the ImageNet data set, this is the original version of this image is labeled as a hen. This is actually a very small, uh, as a very small adversarial per perturbation added to it that you, you can't probably notice. I can't see it. But to a machine, uh, this should be labeled as an ostrich because it lies in the ostrich region of input space. So to a human, this is labeled correctly. To a machine, this is labeled totally incorrectly. And so if you train on this, it's like you're training on an image with the wrong label even though to a human, it seems like nothing is wrong. And in fact, if we train an ImageNet classifier on this, so suppose that we train a ResNet 18. ResNet 18 will get a top one accuracy of 67% on ImageNet. If we train on the original ImageNet, if I train on adversarial ImageNet, which is, uh, you know, has, you know, very often invisible perturbations. To a human, these images look exactly the same as your original ImageNet, and they appear to be labeled correctly. But if you train a ComNet on this, you get 1.5% accuracy. We have some experiments on ResNet, just because of ResNet, it's easier to do experiments. But uh, just showing that you can, these, these attacks transfer really well across architectures. So we're going to uh, take, take uh, CIFAR 10. If I train ResNet 18 on CIFAR 10, I get 95% accuracy. 
if I create adversarial examples using a ResNet 18 network and I replace all of the CIFAR 10 images with their adversarial versions, then when I train ResNet 18 on those, I only get 6% accuracy. What's interesting here is that um, CIFAR 10 only has 10 classes. So a random guess is 10% accuracy, right? A random number generator can get 10% accuracy. But when you train ResNet 18 on the poison data, you only get 6% accuracy. It's worse than a random guess. Right? So like a monkey with a typewriter would do better than, than a classifier trained on this data set. Um, but what's interesting is even though we created these adversarial attacks with ResNet 18, it doesn't really matter what model you train. You can train VGG19, GoobleyNet, you can train MobileNet. These are all really different kinds of architectures, and yet they all do really poorly. In fact, two out of three of them do worse than a random guess. So if you want to do a whole data set poisoning, if I can poison all the data that appears on my website, then, uh, then, then this is a really, this adversarial attack I just described is a good way to do it. But maybe we can do something with face recognition where you only have to poison one or two images. Um, and so we created this system called the low key system for doing this and here's how it works. Face recognition systems use this, these uh, Siamese nets. And what they do is they, uh, you have what's called a gallery image. This is the image that Clearview scrapes from your LinkedIn profile. And uh, you push that through a neural network and it creates a feature embedding for it. So in this case, you put Yoda through the network and, and all, the, all the Yoda images end up getting clustered together into Yoda space. Now at test time, you know, we capture Yoda on security footage and we wanna say, who's that guy in that security footage? So what we do is we give the image to something like Clearview and Clearview will crop out the face and they push it through a neural network. Oops, didn't mean to do that yet. Push it through a neural network and then it gets mapped to a feature vector. And that feature vector is really close to all the other Yoda images in the gallery. And so it says that's Yoda. So here's what Loki does. Loki makes an adversarial perturbation to your social media images so that they lie in really strange locations in feature space. They don't lie in the location where your face images are supposed to be. <clears throat> so now when your uh, you know, if the security camera footage comes through, it gets mapped to where Yoda should be. So it gets mapped to Yoda's face but all of Yoda's social media images are living in Boba Fett space because the adversarial perturbations move them away to somewhere strange so that you can no longer do this matching in feature space. Um, and when we, when we uh, create these adversarial images, we look at different uh, face recognition architectures and different backbones and different kinds of image distortions like JPEG compression and cropping and image blur, all sorts of things to simulate what might happen in a real industrial face recognition pipeline. And by doing this, we can actually defeat some pretty powerful systems. So uh, our perturbations will degrade the accuracy of Amazon Recognition API from 93.7% to 0.6%. Uh, if all the gallery images for an identity are passed through the low key filter, it degrades the accuracy a lot. Amazon Recognition won't just make a top one guess of an identity, though it gives you a top 50 list of all the people that it could be. And if you let it make 50 guesses, there's a 2.4% chance that one of them will be correct if uh, Loki has been used to filter images. Microsoft uh, Azure's uh, API is a little bit weaker. It only gets 90.5% accuracy on the Celeb A data set. But if you filter the images, that goes down to 0.1% accuracy. And here's some of the examples of the face images. We don't, you know, a lot of people like to do adversarial examples and claim that they're imperceptible. Um, for the stuff I showed you before with the, with the data set poisoning, very often we can make imperceptible perturbations. But if you want to just poison one individual identity and not a whole data set, the perturbations you need tend to be larger. And in this case, I, I do not claim that the perturbations are imperceptible. Uh, for low resolution images, the perturbations are fairly small. For higher resolution images, the perturbations are much more noticeable. Um, so this does impact the quality of images, but it is interesting that with these kinds of perturbations that don't really affect human perception much, uh, you can completely defeat even very powerful commercial APIs. So I'm gonna pause for a moment here and see if there's any questions about adversarial examples because I'm about to move on and talk about uh, thinking systems. There are at least some questions. Um, I'll toss you one though briefly. Um, have you got any reaction from like the media or any of these uh, scraping companies building class face classifiers like based on your work? Uh, yeah, Loki was uh, has had a little bit of uh, of um, media coverage. 
but um, one of the difficulties is actually there's an older system that claims to do something like this that got a lot of coverage, but that system doesn't work. It's mm. sort of a hoax um, when ours actually does it for real. And so it's kind of hard to come in behind it and make the same claim that they did when, when you know, those claims are a little played out. So we've gotten some media coverage uh, and we have talked to a few different uh, companies that are interested in this kind of thing as possible com with possible commercial applications. I actually think that from a commercial standpoint, the more viable thing is this whole data set poisoning that I discussed with the adversarial perturbations. Reason being that, you know, perturbing, using low key to filter your faces actually works pretty well, but it also makes, it kind of pixelates your images a little bit. We have to make some perturbations that are noticeable to a human. And sometimes those perturbations are small, but I still think people are generally not willing to tolerate a filter that changes the quality of their images. Um, whereas if we do whole data set poisoning, we can actually get away with really tiny perturbations that I that I don't think affect human perception much, if at all. And so that seems like a much more viable uh, thing to do. Um, although strangely, you know, this sort of low key stuff has gotten a little bit more attention, even though I think it's less commercially viable. I think it's kind of captures people's imaginations a little bit more. It's certainly more detectable. Like if a company were to implement you know, on all their stored images to do this, you know, you may not know if they're infringing on your idea or not in terms of, I don't know, I, I know too much about patents now. Um, sure, sure, could be. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the whole data set poisoning stuff yeah. is, uh, is, is much newer and I doubt anyone's doing this pretty much, in a, this is an emerging area. I mean, there's been very little work on creating untrainable data sets. Uh, someone could be doing this and you wouldn't know if they were. I'm a little skeptical. I'm a little skeptical, but actually, I think it's believe it. I, you know, it's strange as it seems. I actually think it's something that people should do. Think yeah, I, I like the idea a lot. I think it's. I think you know, this almost like seems like a place where regulation might play. It. I don't know. Yeah. Like, you got to do something. Yeah. Okay, well, there's yeah. other questions. So, I, I want to just point out, there's companies like I know LinkedIn actually has an entire anti-abuse team that focuses very heavily on scraping. They don't want people scraping, but they focus very much on the system side. So companies do actually invest a lot of money in preventing scraping behavior. And this is just this is an interesting thing that you can do uh, that that protects in people's information even if it's scraped. Um, I, I do think that they should look into doing stuff like this. I think as a tech, you know, for whole data poisoning, like I said, these perturbations are super tiny. And as the, the technology improves, we're still working on this stuff. As the technology improves, I think they'll get even more invisible and to the point where it, it makes a lot of sense to consider doing something like this. Well, I'd ask you more questions, but we have three questions here, and then I, I'm very excited about your next topic. So the first one is, um, some examples reminded me of steganography. Any inspiration from there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is someone mentioned this to me before. Um, I wouldn't say that it was our inspiration. Um, there is some interesting steganographic thing going on, like you, especially with the whole data set stuff. You, you train on images that look like cats, but then it learns what frogs look like. Um, it feels kind of like steganography, but I, the, the algorithms we used to do it are completely different than what people do in, in steganography. Um, so I don't think there's like, a, at least tech, from a technical standpoint, I don't think there's a close relationship, but maybe there's a way that you can use neural nets to, to do steganography uh, in an interesting way. I just think that's, as far as I'm aware, that's pretty unexplored. Uh, the next question is how robust is your approach to simple cropping? Maybe they're thinking about modeling multiple random crops with a, an adversarial example. I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah, quite. We are, so when we train, when we create these perturbations, we actually, uh, it takes, we do multiple gradient updates to produce them. And every gradient update, we use a different uh, random crop. And by doing that, we create a system that is sort of immune to random crops, especially for low key, we anticipate that you will crop the face out of an image. And so it is designed so that random crops will not defeat the adversarial examples. Compression won't defeat them. Even denoising filters actually don't defeat these. You might think you'll just run like a simple denoising filter and remove the adversarial perturbation. That doesn't work either. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, well, that, those were the current crop of questions. I'm sure there'll be more. Okay, let's move on. All right, so this is sort of like the newest uh, kind of strangest stuff that's happening in my lab. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about some of this new stuff. So um, humans are very different than machines because humans can think. Uh, so there's this classical computational theory of mind and the classical uh, theories of mind 
the way that they're set up is that humans have this working memory. And the way that you solve the problem is you embed it in working memory, and then you think about it. So there's this uh, hypothetical entity called the central executive that uh, what it does is it manipulates the representations of memory over time until you find a solution to the problem. And then you spit that solution out and you're done. And this is actually a pretty good model of, uh, we don't know, you know the actual physical mechanisms that make thinking work, but from a cognitive uh, you know, psychology standpoint, it is, this is believed to be a reasonable model of human thought processes. It takes us time to solve problems. And if we train on easy problems, humans can solve very complex problems. I can give you, teach you, I give you a textbook and you'll learn to prove very simple theorems. And then I give you a much harder theorem and uh, you can probably solve it if you think for long enough. So humans, because we have this temporal thinking process, we can solve problems of potentially unbounded complexity just by exerting more computational effort. Okay, uh, so this makes humans really different. The fact that we can think makes humans really different than computers. Um, human reasoning, like I said, it scales to problems of unbounded complexity. You can solve very complicated symbolic reasoning problems and learn, machine learning systems just can't. Um, humans handle really dramatic domain shifts. Uh, machine learning systems fail uh, domain shifts. Humans can synthesize complex strategies from very simple primitives. So it takes a computer uh, about a billion games of chess to become a competent chess player to be trained from scratch. It takes a human about 100 games of chess to be a solid chess player. And a grandmaster has probably played only on the order of 10,000 games of chess uh, in their life, right? But that, the reason why humans can learn to play chess so quickly is because we take the simple primitives that we learn and the logical primitives we learn from losing a few games early on, and then we stitch those together and we think more deeply to create much more sophisticated long-term planning strategies. And this sort of logical reasoning capability is, is something that humans do uh, that machine learning systems for, for games don't. So I guess the question is this, can you build a machine learning system that does these things? Can you make a machine learning system that in some sense of the word thinks? Uh, now we already have systems that achieve, have some of these properties uh, outside of machine learning. And we do this with algorithms, right? An algorithm, you can give it an arbitrarily hard problem and it will solve it. It just might take a very long time. You solve easy problems very quickly. You solve hard problems by exerting more computational effort. And so one way to think about this question of whether machines can think is, is more uh, to ask the question, can you learn an algorithm? Can a machine learning system examine logical reasoning problems and then end to end synthesize a scalable algorithmic process that it can then use to do logical extrapolation and solve more difficult reasoning problems than it has ever been asked to solve during training. In other words, can we create machine learning systems that will solve problems of unbounded complexity just by thinking for longer? That's the question. Uh, and so, uh, spoiler alert, the answer is in some sense, yes, at least we can get take some a few steps forward in this direction. And the way we'll do this is I'm going to take this classical, uh, this uh, computational theory of mind, and I'm going to take out the brain part. I'm going to take out the central executive, and I'm going to replace that with a ResNet block, just a neural network. It's a neural network that manipulates representations and memory uh, in, uh, you know, over time until it searches for a solution to a problem. And it can do this for as long as it needs to solve problems of arbitrary logical complexity. So to make this work, what I'm basically talking about now is a recurrent network, right? You, you take a feature representation, you run a unit on it, then you feed it back in, you run a unit on it, feed it back in, right? Basically talking about a recurrent network. So if something like this is gonna work, we're gonna have to find a way to replace all of the feed forward stuff that we do with recurrence. So a standard feed forward architecture looks like this. Uh, an image comes in and then you, you pass it through a bunch of unique layers and then an output comes out. And it's known that these or at least thought that these systems have what's called layer specialization. The earlier layers in a vision network do are edge detectors. And then you have uh, texture detectors and then you have object detectors at the end. And each layer does something special. If you have ResNet 18, you only have 18 sequential operations that you can do. Any problem that is of su sufficient logical complexity that it cannot be solved with 18 sequential computations is not solvable by ResNet 18, period. Does not matter what your training set looks like. It does not matter what your, your loss function looks like. Nothing matters. Resident 18 cannot 
scale up to solve those problems. And there's no way of increasing the power of resin 18 because once you get to layer 18, you're done. There's no, there's no layer 19, you're just done. So there's no nice way of training on, on easy problems and then increasing the power of the system at test time. But if we use a recurrent architecture, so let's say we have a feature embedding layer, and then we have a recurrent thinking module. So we think, 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 think. We just keep applying the uh, recurrent module to produce thoughts. And then finally, after a while, we, we have a, a layer that rips the solution out of those that feature space in which you're storing all your thoughts, right? It rips it out of the working memory. Um, now we have a system where we could we can have it think for as long as we want. I can just re repeat this layer over and over again, and they'll do all sorts of, hopefully do all sorts of thinking like things, right? So the first question we want to ask is, can you do this? Can you just replace feed forward architectures with occurrence? And it turns out you can. And in fact, the kind of behaviors you get with networks of different depths is the same, regardless of whether you have a feed forward architecture with unique parameters in every layer or a recurrent architecture with, with, uh, with, with the same parameters in every layer. So this is a chart that shows effective depth. So this is the depth of an architecture versus accuracy for different architectures. This is MLPs. And all the red, are, the orange here is for recurrent nets. So there's, there's parameter sharing in every layer. And the blue is a feed forward network with different parameters in every layer. And what we see is the exact same relationship between depth and accuracy happens regardless of whether we use um, recurrence or feed forward behavior. This is on the EM NIST data set. And we see the same non monotonic behaviors here that, like this S shaped thing that happen with feed forward architectures. You have exactly the same relationships with uh, recurrent architectures, and you get similar levels of accuracy. So it actually does, you can basically replace recurrence or, or feed forward behavior with recurrence with almost no loss. <laughs> and if we do feature visualizations, what we find is that these recurrent layers will actually behave differently at different, uh, with different inputs. And uh, in the shallow layers, you get these kinds of edge-based things. You get these more complicated textures at deeper layers. And by the time you get really deep in the architecture, you'll see you get this like eyeball pattern and you get this tree like pattern, you get things that look more like parts of objects. And this is true regardless of whether you're using recurrent or feed forward, we can actually pull out very similar feature maps in both of these architectures, almost identical feature maps when we visualize what neurons respond to inside of these architectures. Okay, so we can replace feed forward with recurrence, and that at least mechanically gives us the ability to increase the computational effort that a neural network is going to expend. But what we need now is we need some logical reasoning problems where we can control how hard they are so we can test it on easy problems or we can train it on easy problems and then see whether it makes the generalization leap to hard problems. And so let's look at mazes. These are procedurally generated mazes. Every maze is going to uh, have a green start point and a red end point. And a network is gonna get this maze image as an input and it's going to have to output a segmentation map that shows me the path to the solution. This is the problem we're going to study. The reason I like this problem is because I can control how hard the maze is just by making it bigger. This is a histogram of the path lengths it takes to exit a maze. And if I have a nine by nine maze, you get relatively short path lengths. And for a 13 by 13 maze, which is larger, that's the one in green here, you have considerably longer path lengths. And so you might think it takes more reasoning steps to solve a harder maze than an easy maze, right? And indeed it does. If we train and test on small mazes, uh, to get 95% accuracy, we, we need 20 layers of depth. And for a larger maze, we need 36 layers of depth to get 95% accuracy. So like you might expect, it takes more sequential thoughts to solve a more complex problem. But then the question we will ask is this, can these networks make a generalization leap and train only on easy reasoning problems and then test on much more complex reasoning problems and figure out how to solve them just by exerting more computational effort and creating, you know, synthesizing more complex strategies from the primitives that they learn on the easy problems. So this is a first, the first demonstration of this kind of behavior we observed. Uh, and this is kind of, a, I would say like a weak logical extrapolation behavior. What we found is that if we train the networks that I described to you before on nine by nine mazes, and then we test them on nine by nine mazes, everything gets 100%, that's easy. If we test, if we train on nine by nine mazes, but then test on 13 by 13 mazes that are harder, 
Now our feed forward architectures, even the best architectures we can come up with only get about 25% accuracy. What's interesting is that a thinking system with recurrence does much better, like it's almost twice as much accuracy if you test it with the same number of iterations that it was trained with. So these networks were trained using 20 iterations on a nine by nine maze. And we're testing it with this dot uh, with 20 iterations on a 13 by 13 maze. What's interesting is that if you turn a knob up and you just increase the number of thoughts, you let it think for longer, suddenly uh, the accuracy goes up and you can actually solve, uh, get considerably higher accuracy by thinking longer and extrapolating outside of the training regime. You get higher accuracy than you did inside the training regime. And the process that these mazes are solved by is kind of an interesting one. If you look at the outputs, intermediate outputs, when it tries to solve these things, it starts by highlighting the whole maze. And then this upper left quadrant disappears. And then this lower left quadrant disappears. And then this uh, all this extra stuff on the lower right disappears. And then so it's sort of like lopping off parts of the maze that are inviolable <laughs> until it ends up with a solution to the problem. OK, so in conclusion, neural nets are capable of generalizing to 13 by 13 mazes. And it succeeds about 70% of the time. The end, right? So that's not a very uh, satisfying conclusion, right? We got these made. To me, this was a really interesting proof of concept. Um, we actually submitted a version of this paper to a conference a while ago. It got very handily rejected. They hated it. They thought there was nothing interesting going on and the problems we solved were trivial, blah, 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 blah. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, we got to find a way to make this work better. So here's what we figured out. When you, when you run these recurrent systems, their performance increases for a while, and then it, and you start solving harder and harder problems, and then it just nosedives, just fails. So what was going on, we figured, is that you, know, you have this recurrent unit, and it has to store the problem instance that it's solving. Well, when you, when you run the recurrence again, and you write back to memory, you're overwriting the old memory, and you, you need to preserve the problem instance in that memory. But the problem is that the you know the weights of this of this recurrent unit they're kind of noisy. Uh, they were trained with a really noisy SGD process. They're not very accurately tuned, and so when you write back, you're making a, you know a copy, and it's not a very good copy. And then you do the recurrence again, and you made a copy of a copy, and then you make a copy of a copy of a copy, and eventually you just end up with garbage, right? If you want to make good copies, you always have to have a, the original. So we have these recall networks that's doing the same thing. But there's a skip connection that goes from the input to the uh, to the to, into every thinking layer. So before every thinking step, we take the current memory and we append the problem we're trying to solve to it, so it just lives in memory. Then we push that through the network; it produces some new output features. Then we write that back to memory, and then we append the problem we're trying to solve to it again before the next iteration. And by doing this, we make it so it's, it's impossible to forget what you're doing. You can't, you can never lose information through noise degradation. It's all, all the information you need is always present in memory space. We also do this thing called uh, incremental training. And what this does is it prevents, well, like I said, well, I, don't, I don't want networks with layer specific behaviors. I don't want it to learn a behavior at layer one, two, three, four, five. If you only train the five iterations, it'll learn five layer specific behaviors. And then at layer six, it has no idea what to do, right? So we have this training process where what we do is we run a forward pass and then we delete a bunch of these layers at random before we do the backward pass. And what this does is it basically makes it so that it's impossible for the network to learn layer specific behaviors because the layer number that this feature representation occurs at is randomized. So it can't rely on doing a particular thing at layer five. It has to learn a generic thinking module that looks at the representation of the problem it has right now and then modifies it to make it better no matter what it starts with. So this gave us much better performance. This is the original nine by nine to 13 by 13 generalization task that I showed. And these dotted lines are our older models. And you'll see that they start to rise out of the training regime and then they just nosedive, they just fall. But our newer models with recall, those are these solid lines, they rise out of the training regime and the accuracy just goes up and up and up until you hit hundred percent. And then it just stays there forever. You can just iterate on these things for many hundreds of iterations and they just stay there rock solid. Okay, so now we can, you know, we don't have this degeneration. Maybe we can get the iterations to go further and we can solve bigger problems. So this is an example scaling up to 59 by 59. By the time you get past about 50 by 50, feed forward 
uh, networks can no longer generalize at all. So this is training on nine by nine and testing on 59 by 59. And there's these dotted lines at the bottom. These are all of our old models and the best feed forward networks that we can train. They cannot, they cannot make that generalization gap. They get 0% accuracy, no matter what you do. But actually these new thinking systems is calling them thinking plus plus with all these modifications. They, they get 0% in the training regime. They can't solve any of the 59 by 59 mazes using the 20 iterations that we train with. But then if you run them for a long time, instead of, remember they only train with 20 iterations. If you run them outside of the training regime, they suddenly start to figure out how to solve these problems. And if you run for 750 iterations, you can solve all of these 59 by 59 mazes quite reliably. So that was interesting. But then I said, well, if that worked, maybe we can just scale up big time, right? People aren't interested in solving little, you know, we don't write algorithms to solve little problems. People have to do with like databases and search algorithms, all sorts of things, right? Can we just scale up and get really big? So my students made this, uh, well, the first thing we did is we started looking at some other problems. So this is an example of uh, what's called prefix sum. So this is an easy problem. And so I figured we'd be able to get big scalability on this, hopefully. Um, and so prefix sums, the way, way this problem works is I give you an input sequence of binary digits. And then you have to, the network has to read this in, do a bunch of convolutions on it and produce an output sequence that contains the cumulative sum mod two for this input sequence. And we can control how difficult this problem is by making the input sequence shorter or longer. Um, so if we train on 32-bit problems, we can then test on 512-bit problems and what we find is that uh, in the training regime, we only trained with 30 iterations on 32-bit problems. In the training regime, you get 0% accuracy. When you give it a 512-bit problem, these uh, 30 iteration networks, they completely fail, we get 0% accuracy. And this dotted line at the bottom is all of the other feed forward architectures that we tested. But our thinking systems, they, they continue to get 0% accuracy for a long time until they've had about 100 thoughts. And then suddenly they start to improve and they saturate at 100% accuracy. So they can solve 100% of the training instances that we generated for these 512 bit problems. If you let them think for long enough, but you have to let them think for about 150 times longer. It takes about 150 times as much computational effort as it took to solve anything in the training set. Okay, so this is a nine by nine maze. This is the training set. And I kind of thought that to solve big mazes, we'd eventually have to get away from this. The reason we were doing nine by nine and 13 by 13 is our original architectures couldn't handle very much. And I figured once we got to bigger architectures, we'd have to train on bigger things if we want to handle bigger problem instances. What is strange to me is that it turns out we don't. So this is a nine by nine maze. We're going to train on a data set of only nine by nine mazes. And then I had my students generate this uh, 201 by 201 maze. So we train on nine by nine mazes using 30 iterations. If you give the network 2,400 iterations, it will then solve this 201 by 201 maze. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I said, well, let's just see what the limits are. What is the biggest maze that we can possibly solve with this sort of thing? And so I had my students, oh yeah, here's the solution. So then I asked, what's the big, biggest maze we can possibly solve? So my students made this maze. This is a pretty big maze. This is the biggest maze that we can solve, not because the network fails beyond this necessarily. We don't really know. This is just the biggest maze that will fit on a GPU that we have. And we don't have a, a parallel implementation that can split it across GPUs. Um, maybe we'll be able to push further by you know, getting the memory of the architecture down. We haven't really tried. But with the current architectures we have, this is the biggest that fits on our GPU. Um, and it will solve this maze. This is the solution path that the neural network generates. Uh, it's the correct solution path. And it took 20,000 thoughts to do this. Each thought, the network we're actually using for mazes now is uh, every thought is actually a five layer network, a uh, five layer sub network. So there's two, it has a one by one column and two ResNet blocks. So actually this is uh, with the embedding layer and the extraction layer at the end, this is, uh, uh, this is doing 100,004 uh, 100, layers of computation. So it's able to solve this problem, but it takes a 100,000 layer network uh, to do it. And what's interesting is that it actually does produce the correct solution path. Technically, we have a toolkit that will produce mazes of arbitrary size and will tell you if your answers are right and wrong. We have a whole software package for tinkering with these kind of things. 
According to our software, software package, actually, this is not the correct solution. This is the wrong solution. And I wanted to know why, because looking at this, I couldn't tell the difference between this and the actual correct solution. And it turns out that the way that we represent the solutions, uh, the solution path is actually two pixels wide. And the reason we do that is if it's one pixel wide, some of the image visualizations you do on a Mac will blur over everything. So we made all the, you have to represent the solution as being two pixels wide and the network left out a pixel right there. It's missing, it made it one pixel wide in that one location. So technically this is not the solution to the problem, but I mean, effectively it, it actually managed to solve this um, maze with about a hundred thousand layers of convolution. Okay. So, so far, all the problems that we looked at, we can go from easy to hard, but in some sense, we're really just going from small to large, right? We wanted to look at some problems where there's some human metric of difficulty that is different than just problem size. So we decided to look at chess. So there's this online website called leechess.org. I'd never heard of it, but my students love it. They play on it all the time. And uh, what it does is that, you know, humans can play each other, but Lee Chess does this thing where it'll collect game states that are seen during human play, and it runs a chess engine against them. And if it thinks that there's one unique best solution, then it labels it with that solution, the, ne the next move, and it puts it in this catalog of what it calls chess puzzles. And people actually apparently love to do these chess puzzles. Uh, that's not what I do with my time, although I guess what I do with my time is answer emails and, and write grants. So it's probably more fun to do chess puzzles. Uh, but people like to do these chess puzzles and they're actually ranked against humans. So humans have rankings on the chess that show how strong they are at chess. And it, it ranks these puzzles against humans. And so every puzzle has what's called an ELO rating that tells you how difficult the puzzle is. So the way what we're gonna set up the network is the network's gonna get to see an image of a chessboard. And then it's gotta think about the game for a while. And then it has to output a map that highlights two pixels, one for the starting point for the piece that's gonna move and one for the location it's gonna to move to. So in this case, this rook is, the black is moving next. This rook is gonna attack this bishop. And the way that will be represented in the system is that you highlight the rook and you highlight the bishop. That's the output that I want the network to produce. Okay, so Lee Chess you know, has a bunch of puzzles. What we did is we took, that has about 1.5 million puzzles. We took the first million of them, but we took, we took all the puzzles, we organized them from easy to hard. And we took the first million of them and we're gonna take uh, the first 600,000 puzzles. Those are the easiest puzzles. Uh, as a train set. And then the test set is gonna be the next 200,000 puzzles. So those are hard puzzles. And the question is, can you generalize them easy to hard? And it turns out that feed forward networks can actually do this to some extent. Uh, the recurrent, the feed forward behavior is this dotted line. And then uh, behavior of a recurrent network versus iterations are these uh, other lines. So without the, 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 um, the recall skip connections, you get the raise in performance and then you kind of fall off. But you're not able to actually get better performance by a significant margin outside of the training regime. What's interesting is with the recall, you can think about these problems forever and you don't really overthink. So once you get to the training regime, which is 30 iterations, you can actually unroll the network and keep thinking. And the accuracy on hard problems increases by about 2% if you keep thinking. So it actually is able to extrapolate it outside the training regime. And there's a few thousand puzzles in the, in the test set that it's able to solve uh, by thinking for longer that it was not able to solve uh, by using the amount of computational budget that it had in the training regime. And this is just kind of visualizing what a what what is it thinking about? So you know, at any time we can have the output layer, we can run the output layer, the, the output module on the on the uh, working memory, and we can see what it's thinking. So when the network begins, everything is just. 50-50, uh, it doesn't know what pixel is good, what pixel is bad. You run this for about 15 iterations and then something emerges. There's a red dot up here and there's kind of a yellowish dot down here. What's going on is that the, the solution to this chess puzzle is that this rook should attack this rook. That's the solution. But you'll notice there's also a little purplish blob here and there's a purplish blob here. What's going on there? Well, uh, there's another move you can make, which is that this queen could actually move over here and it could put this, this will put the king in check. That's not as good a move as moving the rook. Uh, you have a better downstream outcome if you, if you attack with the rook, but it is aware that this is a viable move and it's thinking about it. And then you run for a while longer and that queen move starts to fade away and then suddenly it becomes very confident 
you know, it goes to 100% confidence that it wants to move that rook, um, which is the correct solution to this chess puzzle. Okay, so, so just to wrap up, some thoughts about thinking. Thinking systems, something that's interesting about them is they seem to kind of uh, have generalization behaviors that lie outside of what we conventionally think of in the theory of literature. Usually in machine learning, you train on one distribution and you test on the same distribution. This is a situation where the test distribution is disjoint from the training distribution. All the test problems are hard and the train problems are easy. And you might think that a model trained only on easy problems won't generalize to hard problems. If you think that, then you are correct. The models trained on easy problems do not generalize to hard problems. The way that we generalize to hard problems is by changing the model. If we take a 20 iteration network trained on nine by nine mazes, that depth 20 network cannot solve, um, cannot, you know, a network with 20 recurrent blocks cannot solve uh, 800 by 800 maze. It gets 0% accuracy on, on anything, you know, 50 or beyond. But if you then increase the depth of the architecture, so we're actually changing the model from, you know, from 20 to 20,000 blocks, uh, you're producing a new model with much greater depth and that new model has different behaviors than the old model and that new model is capable of solving the 800 by 800 maze so there's kind of a sense here in which these generalization leaps um kind of step outside the bounds of what you would expect to achieve with you know conventional notions of generalization um thinking systems are also interesting because we only show them a problem and a solution and they synthesize an algorithm end to end so I'm not giving it any stepwise supervision of what the steps of the algorithm should be. For example, for prefix sums, I could feed in one bit at a time and then supervise the output bit for the network. And I could teach it, here's step one of the algorithm, here's step two of the algorithm, here's step three of the algorithm, right? We don't give it any supervision. We just say, solve this maze in 20 steps or less. And then it naturally synthesizes a scalable uh, recurrent process for solving the problem with no human supervision over what that process should be. And then that process that it synthesized is then scalable to problems of extremely large size. And then the last thing I'll mention is a lot of gameplay systems like things for chess that we use today actually use handcrafted algorithms and machine learning plays only a minor role. An example of that would be something like AlphaGo. AlphaGo actually plays chess. All of the, all of the strategy and gameplay mechanics actually happen inside of a handcrafted Monte Carlo tree search. And a machine learning model is only used to prune the tree uh, and, and speed up that tree search. What's interesting is that if you can actually learn these kind of search behaviors end to end, which seems to be what we do for mazes, it's, it's ambitious, but it's at least feasible to think that you might be able to learn an entire game playing system end to end. So you, don't, you might not need a handcrafted Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. You might be able to learn that search behavior end to end with an algorithm instead of having to and craft it. All right. And then finally, thank you very much for listening. I finished right in time. Uh, uh, here's a list of papers that I spoke about. Um, if you have a few minutes to hang around, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.